We identified risk factors for allergic cross-reactivity among penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and monobactams. We distinguish between common types of superficial and necrotizing soft tissue infections, including causative pathogens. Given a patient with a superficial skin and soft tissue infection, let's recommend IDSA guideline concordant treatment. Staphylococcus aureus and group A streptococci constitute the large majority of skin and soft tissue infections. This is a slide from the CDC, which essentially ranks different resistant organisms uh, based on threat level. So for erythromycin resistant group A strep, this is a level concerning. So they have three levels concerning, uh, serious and urgent, and this one is concerning. In particular, resistance to erythromycin has been increasing year after year, and erythromycin is the surrogate for the entire class of macrolides. So essentially, we can consider this resistant to the macrolide uh, antibiotics. And in addition, we're also seeing increasing rates of resistance to clindamycin. Let's take a look at the spectrum of activity of common antibiotics used for skin and soft tissue infection. Of course, uh, here we have viral type strep pneumo, uh, drug resistant strep pneumo, beta hemolytic strep, MSSA, MRSA, and some gram uh, negatives. Now, in particular, we are going to focus on beta hemolytic strep and MSSA and MRSA. So you can see that penicillin has excellent activity against beta hemolytic strep, but no activity against MSSA or MRSA. The same uh, for amoxicillin. Uh, no activity against MSSA or MRSA. And because amoxicillin standard dose has excellent activity against beta hemolytic strep, there's really no role for a high dose amoxicillin that normally will work well for strep pneumo. For uh, beta hemolytic strep, it's unnecessary to use high dose amoxicillin. Now, when we want both beta hemolytic strep uh, coverage and MSSA, because MSSA makes uh, penicillinases, there is a need for clavulinate. So amoxicillin clavulinate, excellent activity for both beta hemolytic strep as well as MSSA, but no activity against MRSA. Dicloxicillin, which is our anti-staphylococcal uh, penicillin, has excellent activity against MSSA, in fact, one of the drugs of choice for MSSA, uh, and in general, it has uh, uh, good coverage for beta hemolytic strep, uh, but you know, there are some strains of beta hemolytic that may be uh, resistant to dicloxicillin. So, uh, you know, if uh, we have other options for beta hemolytic strep, uh, it's best to use those, but still, uh, you know, it does uh, have uh, high, high activity against them. Cephalexin, your first generation cephalosporin, uh, essentially excellent activity against beta hemolytic and MSSA and that's true with uh, pretty much most of uh, first generation, second generation and third generation. Uh, the only exception with the second generation is the cephamycins are uh, you know not included. Of course they, we don't have oral options for uh, cephamycins um, but you know the rest of second generations have excellent activity against beta hemolytic strep. Bactrum has uh, excellent activity against beta hemolytic strep and uh, MSSA and also against uh, community acquired uh, MRSA. Now there is historically been a myth about trim sulfon not being active against beta hemolytic strep and in fact the 2014 IDSA guidelines typically do not recommend Bactrum anytime that uh, you are covering beta hemolytic strep. However, in recent time, that myth has been debunked, and anytime that we have uh, concern for beta hemolytic strep, uh, uh, trim sulfa is an excellent choice. With clindamycin, as I mentioned, there is increasing rate of resistance uh, in beta hemolytic strep. Uh, the same in community acquired MRSA, there is increasing re rate of resistance to condomycin. Uh, it does, however, maintain good activity against MSSA. Ciprofloxacin, in general, has poor gram positive um, coverage. Uh, it can cover MSSA, but no coverage for MRSA or beta hemolytic strep. 
The levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, those are the two that have excellent activity against beta hemolytic strep, as well as MSSA. And levofloxacin doesn't cover MRSA, but moxifloxacin can cover some uh, community acquired MRSA. Um, uh, but you know, the rate of resistance can also be in, uh, might be increasing uh, in moxifloxacin. Erythromycin and the rest of macrolides, so erythro, um, erythromycin uh, was the surrogate for this class. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, rate of resistance in beta hemolytic strep is increasing, and that's very concerning. Uh, you know, uh, uh, act still active against MSSA, no activity against MRSA. And lastly, the entire class of tetracycline, so doxycycline, uh, most commonly used as oral agent. Uh, has poor activity against beta hemolytic strep. So anytime you need beta hemolytic uh, strep coverage, uh, you should not be using doxycycline. Uh, it is an excellent choice if you need uh, MRSA or MSSA coverage. So it's oral and excellent uh, coverage against community acquired MRSA. Here are the IDSA recommendations for the management of empatigo and uh, ectima. As we have discussed previously, um, empatigo is uh, essentially the infection of the epidermis. Ectema can also uh, go into the dermis uh, layer. So, um, so ect ect ectema is deeper level. So that's something to keep in mind when we're deciding to use topical or oral agents. So in general, uh, you know, with uh, you know, we know that the most uh, causative Pathogens are um, MSSA, most common, and uh, beta hemolytic uh, strep. So with empatigo, because it's only in the epi, um, because it can be in the epidermis uh, only, uh, we can use topical agents. So uh, you know these are some ointments and creams that patients can apply to the area, and that's best because it goes to the site of infection and it doesn't cause collateral damage, for example, affecting the gut microbiome. Now, with uh, both empatigo uh, and um, ectema, ectema because it goes to um, uh, dermis layer, uh, oral antibiotics are recommended. And uh, the way uh, you choose between topical and oral for empatigo, essentially the number of lesions affect, uh, and, and also if there are multiple people uh, you know, in the household might be uh, at risk of getting the infection. So to for infection control or transmission control. Um, but anyway, for uh, oral treatment options, you know, when targeting MSSA and beta hemolytic strep, which are the most common causes, uh, oral agents, uh, cephalexin, amoxicillin, clavulinate are the best coverage. So uh, cephalexin, uh, most commonly, uh, the problem with cephalexin is that patients have to take it four times a day, uh, whereas amoxiclav, you can do it twice a day, so it's nicer. Other options include dicloxacillin and clindamycin, so they may not be the best for beta hemolytic strep, but they are uh, you know, available options in case uh, the other ones are not available. And of course, Bactrom will also cover MSSA and beta hemolytic strep. Uh, in general, uh, Bactrom is reserved when you need MRSA coverage. Clindamycin is not the best thing for um, uh, it's not the best thing for MRSA coverage. So Bactrom and doxycycline have much better MRSA coverage. Now, if you do use doxycycline, keep in mind that it does not cover beta hemolytic strep. So if you're using doxycycline for MRSA coverage, you need a second agent to cover beta hemolytic strep. And there is no need for IV treatment. So empatigo relatively, uh, you know, the least severe type of skin and soft uh, tissue infection compared to other types of skin and soft tissue infection. Uh, now, gram uh, stain and culture of the pus are recommended, uh, you know, if, if available, but it's, you know, um, treatment without these is also reasonable. So, you know, if you don't have uh, culture results, you can totally do these creams or these treatments for seven days and you'll be done uh, with treatment. Now, these are the uh, regimens that I had mentioned. So keep note of uh, the frequency of doses because uh, some of these that are four times a day, uh, they are um, less likely to have uh, adherence in patients. Now, slightly more severe is uh, purulent skin and soft tissue infection. So these are things like abscess, uh, carbuncle, furuncles, um, and 
essentially for treatment of these, which, you know, because uh, pus is uh, driving these, so these are purulent, the large majority are Staphylococcus aureus, okay, either MSSA or MRSA. And it is possible to have beta hemolytic strep, right? So uh, Streptococcus pyogenes could be uh, pus generating, but uh, in general, they are rare. So the treatments are essentially targeting uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Now, we do need to assess the severity of purulent infections and break it into mild, moderate, and severe. And that's driven by presence or absence of SERS criteria. So if no systemic signs of infection, uh, that's essentially mild. And all you need to do is incision and drainage. So essentially, it's a uh, you know, you know um, source control uh, strategy. So once you remove the pus, the patients will uh, will recover. So no need for antibiotics. Now, if there are systemic signs of infections, uh, and the patient should of course be hemodynamically stable. In addition to incision and drainage, the patient will receive oral antibiotics. Okay, so oral antibiotics that's primarily targeted at MRSA. So uh, trim sulfa or doxycycline, and for some reason, if these are not available, clindamycin. Clindamycin, last choice, not only because of increasing rate of resistance, but also collateral damage uh, from clindamycin is much more severe. So C. diff in particular is an issue. Now, if there are uh, culture results uh, available, of course, we want to de-escalate once the culture results come back. Uh, you know, uh, there, of course, these are pretty narrow in general, so there's not much we can de-escalate. Uh, but for example, when we go to severe, and that's essentially if somebody previously had, um, you know, incision and drainage and PO antibiotics and they failed treatment, uh, you know, they essentially get labeled as severe infection and they would require IV antibiotics in addition of incision and drainage. Or if somebody had multiple systemic signs um, or plus acute hypotension, organ dysfunction, or if somebody is just immunocompromised. So if, the, if it doesn't have any of these, you know, purely if a patient is just immunocompromised, we will consider that the severe infection and we will, they will have to receive IV antibiotics. And again, antibiotics are targeting MRSA. So our drugs of choice are vancomycin uh, for the largest, um, you know, for, for the most part. Uh, but also daptomycin, linazolid, uh, ceftaroline, uh, and there are some, uh, you know, long-acting anti-MRSA agents that we have that even a single dose is good enough. You know, these are dalbovancin and oritavancin. Their half-life is somewhere between 200, 300 um, hours, so they're pretty, pretty long. So, it, so, so a single dose will actually last uh, for a week or so. So IDSA guideline recommendations uh, do say to gram stain and culture, uh, gram stain and culture of pus, um, you know, are recommended. But again, depends on the severity. So you may not necessarily need those. Incision and drainage is the cornerstone of purulent uh, uh, skin and soft tissue infections. And we discussed uh, how to choose anti-staphylococcus aureus agents. For uh, uh, clindamycin, uh, one thing that's become significant, especially when we have to de-escalate based on culture and susceptibility results, is the concept of inducible clindamycin resistance and the D-test. So in general, clindamycin resistance is very common in uh, healthcare-associated MRSA, and that's why we don't use it any time we uh, suspect MRSA in hospital-associated infection. Uh, but it does have activity against community acquired MRSA, but as I mentioned, the rate of resistance is increasing. Now, the concept of macrolide inducible resistance to clindamycin is very interesting. So there is the MLSB phenotype, and that essentially uh, stands for macrolides, um, lincosamides, uh, lincosamides, which essentially clindamycin is the only drug in this class. So uh, we usually just say yeah, clindamycin, but lincosamides and uh, group B streptogramins, uh, quinopristin, which we don't really use clinically, so you will not uh, really see this in this course. Uh, but this phenotype essentially is a cross resistance between these three classes of drugs. And what that means is that so the resistance is 
uh, the result of the, uh, an enzyme. So it's a methylase enzyme that's encoded by a plasmid-borne uh, gene uh, called ERM or ERM. And so this gene needs to be active to produce this enzyme, which will break down all three of these classes, right? So, uh, you know, uh, this gene could just be always on. So we call that constitutive um, expression of the gene. So if it's always on, when you get your susceptibility results back, you will see that, uh, you know, Staphylococcus aureus is resistant to erythromycin and clindamycin. Uh, and of course, uh, quinopristin, which we don't really test since we don't use it uh, clinically due to, you know, a lot of adverse effects to, to that. Now, the other thing that can happen is inducible. So maybe this gene is not always on in Staphylococcus aureus, but maybe it will be induced when you use one of these uh, agents. Okay. And... Uh, most likely, they're indu if it's inducible, it can easily be in, uh, induced by macrolides. Uh, you know, it may take um, you know longer for clindamycin to induce this. And essentially, all uh, you know these have the same binding site, and that's why there is a cross resistance and the same mechanism. Uh, so. The problem is if it's inducible and you get your susceptibility results back, it may show resistant to macrolides, uh, but susceptible to clindamycin. And that's a problem because then you might say, okay, uh, it's uh, re resistant to uh, macrolides, so we don't use macrolides, but we will use clindamycin. And then while the patient is receiving clindamycin uh, while on treatment, resistance may, might emerge and lead to treatment failure. So the way to catch inducible um, resistance is to do the D-test. So the D-test is essentially that when you have a plate, uh, so, so here's a cartoon uh, over here. So you have your auger plate uh, where your um, you know, Staphylococcus aureus is growing and you drop two discs. One disc has erythromycin, the other one has condomycin. And then once you drop the disc, uh, you know, antibodies will diffuse in a radius around the disc. And if, uh, you know, if it's killing Staphylococcus aureus, that means nothing will grow around the disc. So you have a zone of inhibition, um, you know, so here's erythromycin and here's clindamycin. And that essentially means that it's susceptible to both agents. Now, if it grows through the disc, that means... You know, it didn't care that there was antibiotics here, it was resistant to it, so it actually grew through, uh, it did nothing. Sometimes you may get, uh, you know, uh, so I will use the example over here. So uh, the example, the panel C, you can see that there is a large zone of inhibition uh, around clindamycin, but it is, uh, you know, uh, it is. Uh, actually has grown close to the uh, to the disc of erythromycin. So panel C over here shows resistant to erythromycin, but susceptible to um, uh, susceptible to clindamycin. Now that's that's how it normally should be, right? The D test is that if the same test shows you a D shaped in, instead of a complete circle essentially means that because, uh, you know, obviously this is resistant to erythromycin and erythromycin is diffusing through uh, this um, plate. So, so you know, uh, the idea is that as you get, you know, the area that's close to uh, erythromycin, because there is some erythromycin in this area over here, it has essentially induced resistant to clindamycin so instead of having a complete circular shape, Staphylococcus aureus was actually resistant to the area over here. So essentially means the Staph aureus that was over here got, um, you know, induced and it's actually resistant to clindamycin. Whereas on the other side, you don't really have erythromycin over here. So it was not, it did not induce resistant to clindamycin. So you have a zone of uh, inhibition. So what that means is that, you know, you have a D-shape. So this is, uh, so panel D is D-test positive and panel C is D-test negative, uh, which means that if you have D-test negative, it's okay to use clindamycin clinically. When you have D-test positive, it's recommended not to use clindamycin because it's possible that 
once the patient starts receiving clindamycin, uh, you know, uh, halfway through the treatment, uh, you know, there may be enough induction to cause resistance to clindamycin leading to treatment failure. Now, before we move on to non-purulent skin and soft tissue infection, I want to uh, emphasize the role of incision and uh, drainage or uh, incision and debridement. Uh, so essentially, in purulent uh, incision and drainage or uh, debridement is the mainstay of therapy. Whereas for non-purulent, because there is no pus, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, it's really antibiotic therapy, the corner store, uh, the cornerstone of treatment. So here, uh, slightly more severe is cellulitis. And uh, we know that um, cellulitis goes deeper um, into the skin. So it can actually uh, be a, um, you know, it can uh, have um, dermis layers as well as it can go deeper, a little, a little deeper into subcutaneous uh, layer. So again, with non-purulent skin and soft tissue infection, the most common cause is beta-hemolytic strep. Um, and it can also have MSSA or MRSA uh, as a contributing factor. Uh, just like purulent SSTI, we break non-purulent SSTI into mild, moderate, and severe using the same criteria. So uh, mild is no systemic signs of infection, moderate is systemic and um, hemodynamically stable. And severe essentially uh, means failed PO antibiotics or uh, multiple sy uh, systemic signs plus, uh, you know, organ dysfunction or immunocompromise or if signs of deeper infection. So one thing with non-purulent SSTI, we're, you know, it's, we're getting one step closer to the most severe skin, so, uh, skin and soft tissue infection, which is necrotizing. So if you suspect, uh, you know, signs of necrotizing skin and soft tissue infection, uh, you know, uh, th that will be considered severe. So for mild, uh, so so note that incision and drainage, uh, you know, is not driving treatment, so it's antibiotics. So for mild, we do use uh, oral antibiotics. And uh, so, you know, uh, this is geared towards beta hemolytic strep. So penicillin is okay. The problem with penicillin is four times a day. So even though we're not covering Staphylococcus aureus, you know, uh, penicillin is okay. Um, uh, you know, so people usually don't use it just because it's four times a day. Cephalexin um, is also four times a day, so it has the same problem, but it also covers um, MSSA. Uh, trim sulfa, uh, which is not in the guideline because they thought that it doesn't cover beta hemolytic strep, but we have learned that it does. Uh, Amox clav is also not included in the guideline um, for some reason, but it you know we know that it has excellent activity against beta hemolytic and uh, MSSA, and it's twice a day dosing, so it's very convenient. And then uh, for moderate, uh, you know you want to go to IV antibiotics, and also with mild, so it's more you know these patients can be treated in the outpatient setting with moderate, uh, you know you uh, IV antibiotics. So this patient typically get hospitalized not only because IV antibodies, but this is getting one step closer to severe, which can lead to necrotizing skin and soft tissue infection. So this is, you know, why, uh, you know, although these patients are hemodynamically stable, we use IV antibodies because we want to manage this as soon as possible to minimize the risk of necrotizing skin and soft tissue infections. Uh, so for uh, these patients, of course, cultures of blood and cultures of swabs of, um, you know, of the infection site is recommended. And, uh, you know, when uh, targeting beta hemolytic strep, uh, penicillin is still recommended, except this time it's IV. Now, when covering both beta hemolytic, beta -hemolytic strep and MSSA, cefazolin uh, is uh, the drug of choice. So first generation, uh, you know, some people might use ceftriaxone is once a day, but it's more likely to cause collateral damage uh, ceftriaxone. And uh, of course, condomycin is there too. And then for severe, this is where, you know, you want to really act quickly and, uh, you know, mobilize multiple teams, including uh, surgical evaluation is really important to make sure that it's not getting to the necrotic point. And at this point, broad spectrum antibiotics are actually recommended. So it, so I know that we're trying to cover beta hemolytic strep and MSSA, but 
uh, you know, we're actually going to cover gram negatives because this is getting serious. So, uh, you know, we don't want people to die. So vancomycin to take care of, uh, you know, M M MSSA, MRSA, um, you know, you do want to cover MRSA for these severe infections. So vancomycin plus uh, piperson tazobactam is um, what's routinely used. And... Um, uh, also, these have uh, anaerobic coverage too. So, uh, so piperson tazobactam in case there is necrotic tissue with anaerobes growing, uh, they have piptazo. Uh, now, the guideline has listed carbapenems uh, because they also cover, uh, you know, gram negatives, including multi-drug resistant gram negatives and anaerobes. So, in general, we want to avoid this uh, if we can because of the collateral damage from carbapenems. And of course, when the results uh, of culture and susceptibility are back, we want to de-escalate as quickly as possible. Here are the recommendations from uh, IDSA guidelines, uh, so in accordance with what I had on the previous slide. So please uh, uh, pause this video and review these recommendations. One thing I want to emphasize, duration of treatment for cellulitis is five days. So five days, uh, you know, unless the patient is not improving, but if everything is going according to the plan, five days is sufficient. And lastly, the guidelines say for uh, systemic corticosteroids, so for example, prednisone 40 milligram daily for seven days could be considered in non-diabetic adult patients, and that is uh, essentially to control the uh, inflammation in the site of infection.